Previously on Hebrew Roots. Uh, globally, there is an interest in uh, Hebrew roots, and in the church, there is a special place of Hebraism and the Hebrew culture in the context of contemporary Christianity. Exactly. There are many unanswered questions, many confusion, as well as gaps when it comes to Hebrew tradition, culture, Christianity, and what has to do. If you look at the Hebrew people. We are looking at their identity, which is their language. Then we are looking at their traditions, which is embedded in three things, their feasts, their laws, and then their diets. Sexual immorality. If the enemy, remember that the word of God says, the angels, in seeing that the daughters of men were fair, they came in and took for themselves all and any of the women that they chose. They took. They didn't go seeking their hand in marriage. They took them for themselves. That is sexual immorality. Any social structure is best understood through its heritage and culture. Since the Bible was written from Hebrew traditions and antiquities, it should be considered from a Hebraic perspective. Unfortunately, Many believers approach Biblical Hebrew concepts with a Western mindset. This is why developing a Hebraic lens as we go through the scriptures cannot be downplayed. Welcome to Hebrew Roots with Pastor Obed or Ben Adai. And now, the Hebraic concepts and their traditions. Man of God, we have seen that um, Hebrews have got traditions. And then they also have their Hebraisms, yes. which you have enlightened us about. That when we talk about the traditions, we're looking at the, their diet, their, diets, their, festivals, their festivals, and their laws. And, their laws. and then we saw that that relates to their language, the Hebraism relates to the language the, the way, technicalities of the language the technicalities of their language yes. refers to their Hebraism yes. I am a new believer a contemporary believer for that matter under the new creation as a new creation how does these traditions apply to me? Um, I smile because when it comes to traditions like we said already we're looking at diets we're looking at feasts and then we're looking at the laws of the people i think i've spoken about the laws that come under grace and um the feast and then the the, the feast which are the celebrations of the people and then their diets now when we speak of diets we also know that under grace the diets were that we're supposed to abstain from blood and then in the New Testament, they were supposed to drink the blood of Jesus and to abstain from every other blood. Now, so we would have met the requirements for the foods that we're supposed to eat. Now, Paul, in speaking concerning the paradoxes or the traditions, he said that we should hold the traditions. And what were he said? Right down that bed, he said, we should hold it with the bread of sincerity. And this bread of sincerity is Christ, which we eat the communion which we feast on. Having the traditions in view, you see, according to the truth of the word of God, what frustrated Jesus' work most was the traditions of the people. When Jesus spoke, he said, you through your traditions have made the word of God of null effect. So it means that the devil, as powerful as he is, cannot neutralize the word of God unless he takes advantage of the traditions of the people. Now, what were the traditions going to be about? The traditions was now going to be to take advantage of the lifestyle of the people to corrupt the seed. For which reason, he says, they should abstain from blood, abstain from sexual immorality, and then abstain from things strangled and then from idols. Any tradition that promotes these things will destroy the seed. Any tradition that promotes these things will destroy the seed. So, under this context, if you had a tradition 
that destroyed the communion table, feasting in the cup of the Lord, hearing the word of God, any tradition that ended up with you going into celebrations that were inconsistent with the feast which is Christ. Because in the seven feast, which we know belongs to the nation of Israel, Paul says that the reality is Christ. And so we should not be brought into judgment concerning any new moon, concerning any festal season, because they were all a shadow of that which was to come. So now for you as a believer, you would have to understand that Christ is the tradition. Christ is the paradosis. If Christ is the paradosis and we hold on any other tradition apart from Christ, then the word of God is not going to be effective in our lives. It doesn't matter who we are, whether we are new creations or not. Traditions is what makes the word of God of null effect. This is, this is, this is interesting. Um, viewers, we see here that tradition is a double-edged sword. Exactly. It can be used to augment the word of God mm -hmm. or it can be used to frustrate the word of God. Exactly. If the tradition is being used to augment the word of God, then we are going to stop and abstain from idols, blood and uh, fornication or sexual immorality. Exactly. But a tradition that upholds these kind of things then would then contradict and frustrate the word of God. God. Yeah. So now, having come into Christ, remember that I said that the traditions involve your liberty in Christ and then the three things. Yes. Your liberty is foundational in the traditions. So you have the liberty you have the, all things are permissible, but all things are not beneficial. And now that speaks of the liberties we have in Christ. And this speaks of the liberties we have under grace. In the book of Corinth, we see two places where the Apostle Paul speaks concerning the keeping of the feast and the keeping of the traditions. He says that we should keep the traditions as was delivered unto us. Then he also says that we should keep the feast with the bread of sincerity and truth. Remember that I had already cited that the traditions of a people lies in their laws, it lies in their diets, and then it lies in their feasts. And so Paul, in itemizing the traditions as we should keep them as new creations in Christ, was actually speaking to us to ensure that we do not bring in traditions that would destroy the seed of Christ within us. This is the reason why, and that this light of reality in looking at Hebrew traditions, we are, remember, I'm not only referring to the traditions of the Jews only, I'm talking about the traditions of the Hebrews. And when we speak of the Hebrews, we are making reference from people that even predate Abraham. Because Abraham descended from Eber, who was a Hebrew and he himself was a Hebrew downward. So remember we have already said that the Hebrews are not just Israelites and Noah himself was a Hebrew. Adam was a Hebrew. Why do I say that? Because Hebrew, like I said already, speaks of those who came from the regions beyond. When we speak of the regions beyond, what is it? The regions beyond speak of those who came from the regions beyond the east and it actually refers to those who came from heaven. That is the reason why when you read the revelation of Jesus concerning the new Jerusalem, he says that the gates had the inscription of the 12 tribes of Israel. Because Israel as a nation and with a tongue or with a language which is the Hebrew language hail from above, which speaks of the people from the regions beyond. And that is the reason why the Jews actually believe that the Hebrew language is the language of creation. So in looking at our Hebrew roots, where we begin to look at the combinations of the Aleph beds, Jesus also comes on the scene and he says that he is the Alpha and the Omega. He's the Aleph beds. And without the Aleph beds, interestingly, when you read the book of Genesis chapter 1, he says that Bereshit bara Elohim et Hashamayim v'et ha'iret which simply means that in the beginning, God created 
Aleph bits, the heavens, and then the earth. Before there ever was a heaven, God created the Hebrew language, the Aleph bits. So the first thing God created was the word. And this word was the Hebrew language, the Aleph bits. And Jesus comes on the scene in the revelation of Jesus and he says he is the Aleph bits. Remember that without the word, nothing was made that was made. Strangely, when Jesus in his glorious form appeared to Paul, he spoke to him in the Hebrew language. So we know that in the heavens, remember that the entire new Jerusalem, that was the pattern of what David saw, for which reason he decided to establish Zion as the capital of Israel because he was shown the things in the heavenlies. And he went to the new Jerusalem and saw the temple, which is the new Jerusalem. For which reason he wanted to establish the temple in Jerusalem and then bring the reform, which is the tabernacle of David, from tents into temples. Having understanding in this, ushers us into the richness of the Hebrew language. The Hebrew language is actually a heavenly language and when you study a little bit of vibrations and frequency and sounds, it is a particular language that vibrates the mind and brings healing when you stay on it in meditation and in prayer. For it is known that the Hebrew language is the source of the creation. God spoke Hebrew in his creation. Okay. So we see that, uh, viewers, we're, we're seeing that the first thing that God created was not the universe. No. He first of all had to create the Aleph Beth. The Aleph Beth. Which is the Hebrew language. language. Yes. The origins of the Hebrew language. Exactly. And it is from this language, the word, as we have it in John chapter 1, in the beginning was, was the, the word. word. Yes. And nothing was made. That without the word without the word yes so it was the word that came and that is how come um, we see that pastor is uh, illustrating to us how relevant the traditions and the language of the hebrew to us as a contemporary crop of believers yes again you in looking at the scriptures critically you come to a conclusion that apart from the heavenly city being the new Jerusalem and having the names of the 12 tribes on earth, there is only one group of people that have kept this heavenly language till now, which, and which people are the Jews or the nation of Israel. They are the ones who speak the Hebrew. But you see, apart from them, the, like I said, the Judaists and then the Ishmaelites are all Hebrews, but in the Genesis, the Ishmaelites have lost touch of the Hebrew language. However, if you study a little bit of Arabic, you realize that Arabic and Hebrew are so related. They also have Aleph Beit. Now, when you look at the Arabic alphabet, you then are able to appreciate why the Ishmaelites are that related to the Hebrew language? Because Arabic is the closest to Hebrew. And Hebrew is a heavenly language. And the people that have preserved that heritage till now is the nation of Israel, and specifically the Jews. Now, in reading Deuteronomy chapter 32, the verse number 8, the word of God says, in reading Deuteronomy chapter 32, the word of God says, when God was setting the inheritance of the nations of the earth, when he was dividing the sons of Adam according to their bodies, the Bible said he did it according to the sons of Israel. God counted the bodies of the sons of Adam. The entire generation of humanity was programmed to receive their inheritance according to the number of the sons of Israel in Deuteronomy chapter 32. And so that is the reason why up to date, the nation of Israel have preserved this heavenly language and have become a people that have prospered in the earth more than any other people or any other ethnic group. And that is not to elevate 
the people per se, but that is to lay significance to the language of the people and their traditions as well.